Our third speaker is Kathleen Stock, who is an academic philosopher. She recently submitted a witness statement to the Fair Cop Judicial Review that we heard about earlier, and she's going to be speaking about this tonight. Thank you. So, as we heard from Sarah, and as you probably know, a judicial review uh, of Humberside Police and the College of Policing took place late, late last year. And after, it was after Harry Miller retweeted a poem which addressed a hypothetical trans woman as a man with male privilege. And I'm quoting the words that the poem used. And I'm going to... Can you hear... Sorry. Harry Miller... Can you hear me now? Hold it. Right, OK. It's because I'm so tall. <laughs> Sit down. Hold it. <laughs> Can I? Can you hear me now? Is it right? Stand up. Right. So Harry Miller retweeted a poem uh, which addressed a hypothetical trans woman as a man with male privilege, and that was re recorded as a hate incident, as you know. And I, to the review of this process, I submitted a witness statement. I'm not a lawyer, but I am a philosopher, and we spend a lot of time looking at language and making distinctions between different kinds of concepts. And so I'm going to talk a bit about what I said. So there's been a lot of talk about this concept of a hate incident. It's not the recording of a crime, and it's not supposed to be the recording of a crime. It's the recording of a perception of a crime from someone who feels they're a victim or a bystander. Uh, so it's not defined in terms of neutral evidence. It's explicitly subjective. It's recorded as subjective. And it's supposed to be an internal record that goes no further, although, as we know, it might turn up in an enhanced disclosure and barring service uh, check. And that has seemed like, outrageously unfair to many, uh, and Sarah has talked about that. But, and I think it is obvious straight away that it should never have been called a hate incident. That's clearly prejudicial. It should have been called something else because people are going to get confused about what exactly it is. But I do think we should remind ourselves where it came from, and it came from the McPherson report into the Stephen Lawrence mm. murder. And I want to talk a bit about that. So if you read Brian Cathcart's book, about the street, Stephen Lawrence murder and the terrible aftermath, you find descriptions of the disgusting racism that was happening in Greenwich in 1993. Often, hate speech, racist speech, was escalating to violence very quickly. Um, it was a 95% white area, and um, so we see <coughs> certain features recurring. Hate speech, as in slurs, racist slurs, were reliably linked to other crimes like damage to property, and violence and murder. Um, the black community was completely alienated by institutional racism and their experience of it. They used to go and report racism and they weren't taken seriously. And so either they were dismissed or quite often loads of incidents would be record as a sing recorded as a single incident. So I'm just going to read out a bit of the Cathcart book that will give you a sense of why this happened. To take an example, an independent anti-racism group recorded what happened to one Asian woman in Greenwich over a period of three weeks. She was verbally abused and then punched in the arm. A boy deliberately rode his bicycle into her. She was verbally abused and threatened. Another boy rode his bicycle into her. She was verbally abused. Get back, you. Uh, four youths blocked her way as she tried to leave home by car and then abused and threatened her, and that was all recorded as one incident. Mm. Okay. There was also a culture of fear and intimidation of witnesses. So even if there was no evidence, abs well, I mean, there was an absence of evidence, you could not reliably infer from absence of evidence that nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. So it became really important, I think, in that system to record perceptions of racism so that it could be on record, so then you could look back and you could see patterns and you could also see patterns with particular offenders. OK, so I don't think we should lose sight of that as the origin. However... I think things look very different when it comes to Harry Miller's case. So I want to talk about what the difference is. So when it comes to actual crimes, not just the perception of them, the CPS puts lots of different offensive cover, co offences covered by lots of different laws um, under the category of hate crime, but they are never named as such in the law, as far as I know. So there is, um, most of them are covered under the Public Order Act 1986, and in those laws, for those crimes, there is a focus on intention, like 
psychological motives. Did you intend to be hostile? Did you intend to threaten, to harass, to uh, threaten violence or cause a fear of violence? Um, so we also see that focus on intention when we look at how the CPS defines hate incidents. Uh, a racist hate incident is any incident or crime which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility. So again, there's a focus on intention and uh, motivation. Now, as you know, Harry Miller retweeted a poem addressed to this hypothetical trans woman represented as a stupid man with male privilege. And I'm assuming that the fact that this trans woman hypothetical trans woman was called a man and a male was central to the police's perception that there was hostility. I don't think stupid is enough. I think it's a stupid man is supposed to be the thing that's a hate crime or a perceived hate crime. So what I'm interested in as a philosopher is whether that calling a trans woman a man could be reasonably perceived as hate. Could it be intentionally uh, hostile in the way that it needs to be to count as a crime? So I think we need to just remind ourselves as well that that question is not about whether the poem was rude. The poem is definitely rude. Uh, it's not about whether it's unwanted. I wouldn't want to hear it if I was a trans woman, but that's not the question. The police don't get involved in rudeness, or they shouldn't. Um, the question is not whether it's true that trans women are men. That is not relevant, because even if it's false, the police have no business prosecuting people or making false, factually false statements. So I think we shouldn't get distracted by that. It's not about whether it's true or false, it's about whether it's hateful, whether it's intentionally hostile to the right level. Um, and that's really important. This goes way beyond Miller's case because we are told all the time that rejecting someone's gender identity or misgendering is evidence of hate. That's absolutely standard across most policies in most public institutions now. So, Stonewall's de definition of transphobia is the fear or dislike of someone based on the fact they're trans, including denying their gender identity or refusing to accept it. So they have put mm -hmm. refusing to accept someone's gender identity under the umbrella of fear and dislike. They have just assumed it must be fear or dislike. What else could it be? Uh, other examples, I will, you could look at the new CPS guidance for schools. It's in the very first uh, sentence, but I prefer to go to my favourite source of examples, which is universities. Um, so the University of Leeds, in their policy, say, think of people as being the gender that they self-identify as. So they tell you how to think. And this is a policy <laughs> that sets out what you must do on pain of counting as bullying. University of Nottingham says, think of the person as being the gender that they want you to think of them as. <laughs> University of Leeds says, a person should be addressed and referred to using the pronouns which make them feel comfortable. This could be he, she, they, per, here, or other pronouns. Uh, Roehampton, examples of bullying and harassment may include misgendering, referring to an individual's incorrect gender identity, denial of an individual's gender identity. Roehampton also said, it says, <laughs> it is acknowledged that people make mistakes. However, people who are consistent and are found to be malicious will be subject to disciplinary action. So the assumption seems to be either you've made a mistake or you're malicious. If you're consistent, you must be malicious because it couldn't be that you just think that's true. <laughs> you have to be doing something wrong. Roehampton also goes on, this is in their policy, if you make a mistake with pronouns, whether the person is present or not, acknowledge the error, apolo apologise genuinely, <laughs> and move on. But it also says, do not simply assume someone's pronoun based on your assessment of their outward appearance. Oh so I am just saying, do nev never use pronouns at Roehampton. <laughs> it's a disaster. Or we could go back to Stonewall and a glossy, widely circulated 2017 report of theirs, LGBT in Britain, hate crime and discrimination. So they catalogue a number of incidents with examples and a lot of it is completely unacceptable, physical aggression, spitting and use of genuine slurs. But we also find things like Juliet 37 London writing, 
A female security guard refused to search me when I was waiting in line to get into an event. She, she made a fool of me in front of the entire line. She said I wasn't a female and made me stand in the men's line. Now, it seems to me it might be okay if a female security guard doesn't want to search a male-bodied person. And that's not obviously a hate crime, but it's in this brochure as an example of a hate crime. So, as you can see, and you can see with Humberside too, that across the UK people are taking uh, statements about sex as evidence of hate crime. And I think that's an exceptionally ri risky assumption um, because, remember, it's to count as hate speech, it shouldn't be enough to be wrong, it's not enough to be rude. You have to have the right kind of intentional hostility uh, and intention to harass, alarm, threaten... Now, arguably, no sentence on its own removed from context automatically implies serial, serious hostile intentions. Context is always relevant. Um, the best candidates we have are words whose main function is to express hostility, like slurs. Um, the N-word, the P-word, words for women like sluts, <coughs> bitch, whore, words for gay people. <laughs> Words for gay people, you all know the slurs for gay people. Um, but even there, context is relevant because we all know that people within those groups can playfully use them to refer to themselves. And in that case, it doesn't necessarily express <coughs> massive hostility. It can be quite affectionate. So even in the case of slurs, context is relevant. Um, but nonetheless, they are the best candidates we have for words that express hostility because that is their main linguistic function, is to express hostility. The words man and male are not slurs. <laughs> they are to me. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's just ruined my whole argument. <laughs> uh, they are not, Julie. <laughs> calling, calling someone a man is intended to be a completely factual description of their biology for many speakers. Calling a trans woman a man or male is for many speakers intended to be a completely factual description of their biology. We're not arguing about whether it is a fact, we're just saying what do they mean when they say it, what do they intend? They intend to describe that fact, they are not trying to be hostile. Um, and this is what I argue in my st witness statement, we cannot automatically assume intentional hostility from any claim that a trans woman is a man or a male. To underline, uh, underline that point, consider that up until five years ago, nearly everyone in the UK believed that trans, trans women were literally male and men. They thought that we were supposed to go <laughs> along <laughs> with it, but they didn't... Well, I'm talking about nearly everybody then. Now, significant, now there's confusion. Significant numbers of people still do. Significant numbers of people absolutely don't believe that and think that they're not. They genuinely don't. But how could something that only five years ago nearly everyone believed as a factual description now be a hate crime? Yeah. <laughs> five years ago, people hadn't read Judith Butler or read anyone who had read Judith Butler. <laughs> um, they hadn't seen a Stonewall t-shirt which says trans women are women get over it. If they said, yes, trans women are women, they thought that they were doing something really nice and therapeutically helpful to people that they assumed were in distress and they wanted to help, but they didn't think that they were factually describing biology. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, the general idea, you get it, I don't think there is, in most cases, sufficient hostility for anything like the police to be remotely right in being interested in this mm. stuff. I'm not saying it's, not, it's always easy to work out when a belief is hostile or not. I think it's hard. There are a lot of racist beliefs that people think are factual or quasi-factual. There's a lot of sexist beliefs that people think are factual. But if you're on a sliding scale of easy to identify as intended to be factual and easy to identify as intended to be hostile, so-and-so is a man seems to be much more on the factual side than the hostile side. And I think the way you work that out, if you try and work out if someone's hostile, you look at their wider pattern of attitudes. So in Greenwich, 
when people were calling, like in that example I just read out from the book, there was a white, there's, for racists, there's a wider pattern of attitudes. You don't just use slurs, you threaten violence, you think that people are stealing your jobs, you, you do a wider range of behaviours that show that you are in fact hostile. You cannot infer that wider range of behaviours from one person <coughs> saying a trans woman is a man. They may well think, and I want to help them, and I think they should have all rights. I just have a different view to them of what their identity is. So we have to look at wider pictures, I think, and, and that isn't just getting completely lost in this Stonewall law, which says that as soon as you have said something, you must be hateful or hostile, and you can always tell that from what you've just said. And another thing I'm not saying, actually, is that people who say trans women are men are never hostile, because they clearly are. And I think one thing we're not very good at on our side of the fence is acknowledging that quite a few of us are genuinely transphobic. So I do want to just point out that sometimes it is linked to a wider pattern of hostility towards trans people, and I would call that transphobia. Okay. So my final point is this. Um, Recently, it was reported in The Independent that hate crimes have risen by 10% in a year across England and Wales to a new record high. The largest increase was seen in transgender hate crimes, which rocketed by 37% to 2,333 incidents. Now, it's not surprising that they've rocketed if that's how they are now being defined. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to say, it was also reported that one in ten is now prosecuted. Um, now, I think, when I think about the Greenwich, when I think about this McPherson report, and I think about the original um, problem that that apparatus of hate incidents was designed to address, it was intended to deal with pernicious, violent, rampant, systematic racism... And when I think about that, how, pro how that process has become hijacked and manipulated and debased so that precious police resources are now mm. being used, which could have been used to tackle genuine racism linked to this wider pattern of hostile attitudes and violence and is now being put in to harassing women for, or anyone for saying trans women are men. Um, I think when I think about the cost of that to the health of the public conversation about sex and gender and the cost of that to women, that makes me really, really angry. And I think it should make you angry too. Okay.